Welcome to where the weird ones are. Every time I speak, I want the truth to come out. Powerful figures in Hollywood and as well as powerful politicians, who are in fact not human, are they reptiles or they're lizards or perhaps extraterrestrials? It is a human. Go ahead and run. Run home and cry to mama. Let's get weird. What's up, you fucking weirdos? Welcome to another episode of Where the Weird Ones Are. My name is Kevin, but you probably already knew that, and if you didn't, now you do. Today's episode is with Mark Matsky. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. We talked about cryptids. We talked about religion. Um, it was a wonderful conversation, and I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, he's a he's you know he's a really good guy. Um, but I noticed him first um, on a documentary for uh, Small Town Monsters. So he he does work with Small Town Monsters. He's also a pastor, which is pretty pretty cool and um so like i I just talked to him about you know the acceptance that he's received from his church and like believing in in the stuff because like religion some most it's hard to really like a lot of christian beliefs um or a lot of like religion will shun like the paranormal and stuff as it's not real and stuff like that when um right in the bible uh, a man comes back to life so uh the paranormal aspect is there um and and the bible even talks about giants and you know a a bunch of stuff like that you know and it's um it's interesting and he's been widely accepted for for the things that he does so he works with small town monsters on their documentaries he's narrated one or two i think i can't remember he's also a public speaker I mean, being a pastor is, I mean, you're already public speaking anyway, so it, it kind of comes natural, uh, but super nice guy, uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed talking to him. Um, but yeah, he also has a podcast called Monster Study Group, which I entitled this episode by, um, and you know, they, he talks about cryptids and he's considering uh, doing a new podcast with his son. Um, which if he does drop that, that'll be super interesting and I will let you guys know about it. But yeah, so a couple podcasts that I think you should check out would be monster study group, uh, middle-aged and creeped out. Love those guys. Um, amazing podcast. They're doing, uh, amazing stuff over there. Really, 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 really cool shit. Um, I came with fire is a good one. I think you guys should check out and lullaby the fear podcast. All of those podcasts, I think you should check out, and they're really great. Uh, I enjoy listening to them every week. Uh, But with that, I am going to be at Encounter Quest next week. Um, That is next Saturday, April 13th. Um, If you want to come hang out or buy some hot sauce or get some T-shirts or whatever, or even just come and check out the other vendors or speakers to get tickets for the speakers, Head on over to EncounterQuest.com and you can get those tickets. Um, If you're also interested in the meet and greet dinner uh, with the speakers, uh, that takes place uh, April 12th, uh, which is Friday, the the night before um, the event. And you're going to have dinner and chit chat with some of your favorites with the speakers. Um, And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. They also they're also doing, I think, on April 12th. Um, like casting for the kids, like, like, uh, pre-casting or whatever. So that'd be cool to check out. But yeah, if you want 
to get any of the tickets for any of that stuff, uh, EncounterQuest.com is where you want to go. Just Moira, more Mora, um, is the one of the organizers, and she's such an amazing person. Um, I really, really enjoyed having her on, uh, like many episodes now. But she's such a wonderful person. Uh, met her at CryptidCon, and you know, uh, I'm glad. I think I think I could call her a friend at this point. So. Uh, I'm glad to be friends with her. She's an amazing person. Uh, so please help support her by coming and checking out the event. And that, that is in Hamlet, North Carolina. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, go to the website and check out, check, get the exact address and figure out how far it is from you. So if you're in the area, come, come check it out. Uh, 40 and Fest is coming up in June, June 8th, right here in Sanford, Maine. Um, and, uh, to get tickets to that is on Facebook, uh, 40 and fest. Um, and if you can't get to there, uh, just find paranormal five, either on Facebook or Instagram. Um, and they'll be glad they'll be happy to help you out. Uh, they're amazing people as well. Missy and Richie, they're the organizers for 40 and fest. So, and what? else i think that's it so if you're interested in uh being a guest on the show talk about uh you know your experiences experiences with paranormal cryptids aliens ufos all that stuff uh hit me up at where the weird ones are at gmail.com you know i love i love talking conspiracies um so you know hit me up if you if you're interested uh but with that Please leave a rate. Uh, please like, follow, share, and subscribe. Uh, leave a rating and review. That are those are some of the best ways to help this show grow. Um, not that I really care for it to grow, because I just love having conversations, and that's what this this the whole point of this is. It's just to have conversations, you know. And you're not always going to find people that agree with your opinion, and that's okay. Cause we can still be friends anyway, you know? Um, and yeah. So, um, if you're interested in, uh, supporting the show a little bit more than just that, uh, the Patreon is up. It's weirdos only on Patreon. I do conspiracy Tuesdays and story times where I will just tell you a story. Um, whether it's crew, dirt crew, true crime or, like a ghost story of some kind. Either way, it's a story-based way of telling it. Um, what else? Uh, if you want some merch, it's where the weird ones are podcast dot com. Um, where the weird ones are podcast dot com. Did I say that correctly, or was I being a little dumb on that? I don't know. Where the weird ones are podcast.com. There you can go to the store um, and check out the merch. There's a photo gallery of people wearing the merch. There's a blog. I just dropped a new blog post about the Maryland uh, goat man. Um, head on over to the con- contact page for uh, to leave a review uh, or, or a rating. However, you know, if you want to do that through the through the uh website that's cool too um you know so that's about it that's all i got so um i really hope you guys enjoy this uh today's episode mark's a great guy i think you should check out his uh his podcast and check out his work with uh, small town monsters so other than that let's get into this shall we? they're coming to get you barbara
party people welcome to another episode i'm so happy that you're here um i wouldn't have it any other way i love doing this stuff i love talking to interesting people and today um i have somebody i've been looking forward to uh speaking with i've seen him on a couple of uh documentaries for small town monsters and um it is mark i i feel like i'm gonna mess it up but i'm gonna make an attempt uh matsky yeah that's it you got it perfect perfect <laughs> how's it going man say hi to the oh, people yeah well thank you for having me on uh greetings everybody good to talk to you and i'm looking forward to our conversation tonight nice nice so um not sure i'm pretty 100 percent sure that uh the my listeners are gonna at least have some idea of who you are but in case of those who don't um if you don't mind uh telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do sure sure well my my full-time calling is as a pastor in a lutheran congregation in northeast ohio uh, i've been in pastoral ministry for over 25 years at this point which whenever I say that doesn't make sense <laughs> to myself because <laughs> uh, it seems like an awfully long time to do anything. Uh, but my, my uh, roots in like the unexplained and interest in Bigfoot UFOs and all of that good stuff goes back to my, my early childhood really when I uh, started watching TV and saw shows like uh, Bigfoot and Wild Boy on Saturday morning, which was part of the Croft Super Show package. And uh, that was running at the same time as In Search Of, and of course the Bigfoot episodes got my attention right away. And both of those things led me to kind of ask my parents, um, you know, what, is there anything to this Bigfoot thing? Cause I was just absolutely flabbergasted that it could be true. And rather than say yes or no, I said, well, let's go to the library and find out if they know anything. And at that time there was sort of a, this was late seventies. There's kind of a Renaissance in young adult Bigfoot literature, I guess you would call it. And uh, a woman named Marion T. Place was writing a lot of books about Bigfoot for children. And it's starting with right. On the Track of Bigfoot. Uh, she followed that up with Bigfoot all over the country. And then The Boy Who Saw Bigfoot, which was kind of a fictionalized story uh, in which Bigfoot was kind of a, a character of sorts. But that's really what got me started was the reading and uh, the books were, were great. You know, it's so funny because I read those when I was probably seven, eight, nine years old. And then I've gone back to them, obviously, in my adulthood, and they really still hold up. They're, they're, Marion T. Place really did an excellent job of taking young readers through some of the still the most important Bigfoot cases and situations that we still talk about these days. So that really is what got me started. Not too much longer after that, I was probably about 10 or 11 years old when I first got my hands on Mysterious America by Lauren Coleman, the first edition with the black and white cover. And I just yeah. would continually check that out, like renew it as many times as, as I possibly could and then send it back to the library when I ran out. And then as soon as it was available, start you know checking it out again. And that probably more than anything sort of shaped my my viewpoint on a lot of Fordian topics, I would mm -hmm. have to say. So, mm -hmm. you know, those things sort of ebbed and flowed throughout my, my young adulthood, but it really was in 2014 when I took my son, who was, oh, in the neighborhood of nine or 10 years old at the time, we went to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference in uh, the Cambridge, Ohio area. And we uh, were part, we got the VIP package, which meant we got to go to this uh, restaurant thing the night before Ooh. where you could meet all of the, the guest speakers. And on the docket that year were people like Cliff Berrickman. And this was one of Bob Gimlin's first big trips to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference and so on and so forth. So they yeah. would be at this dinner and uh, long story short, we ended up at the same table as uh, a guy who seemed to be about my age and his father. 
and that was Seth Breedlove and his father, Ronnie. And uh, we got talking over dinner and realized that we had a number of interests in common. And of course, I saw him the next day at the Bigfoot conference itself, and we stayed in touch. He um, asked me to come on his podcast, which at the time uh, was uh, related to comic books. It was called Ancillary Characters, and he, he was a co-host with three of his buddies. They talked about comic books almost exclusively, but the um, God's, the first legendary Godzilla film was coming out at that time, and Seth knew that I was interested in Godzilla, so he in, he invited me to come on the show and just talk about Gareth Edwards' Godzilla film. And so not too much longer after that, he said, you know, I'm doing this podcast solo right now called Sass What, a podcast about Bigfoot. Do you want to come on and talk about the Ohio Bigfoot Conference experience? And I said, sure, I I'd be happy to. And uh, from that point on, we started recording. He never asked me to not come back. So <laughs> we started doing the show together and that lasted for about a hundred episodes. And by that time then, um, Small Town Monsters was in full swing and they had done their first yep. project, Minerva Monster. The next big project was Boggy Creek. And Seth invited me and my son to go on that trip. And from that point on, things picked up. Uh, as far as my involvement, the, the 2017 movie um, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge is one that I co-wrote and narrated. And so it's just been ever since working on various projects. I narrated um, On the Trail of Champ by Alexander Petikoff, wrote a couple Kickstarter books for Small Town Monsters. Uh, the first five years of Small Town Monsters was the first one. The On the Trail of Companion was the second. And have just been involved in in numerous projects and have gone from coast to coast. Most recently, the last trip I was on was about a year ago. We went out to British Columbia and sort of Ooh, walked yeah. in the footsteps of John Green and so forth. So in between all that time, you know, we did the Monsteropolis podcast and um, have just been for the last decade, essentially, have had uh, at least uh, uh, one foot in the small town monsters world. And it really, you know, it changed my life without you know, people say that kind of thing all the time. But it's really mm -hmm. true. I, I it, it changed my life entirely just showing up at that Ohio Bigfoot conference back in. 2014. So that's sort of the short, believe it or not, that's the short story that could, <laughs> I could go on and on, but it's, um, it's really been a wild ride and I'm really, really thankful for it. Yeah, man. I, I, I would have to say like the same thing for myself as in like with this podcast, mm -hmm. um, I, the way my life looks now, ever since I started, I would have never fathomed that it would would be like this you know yeah i've met so many like really good people and like everybody in this field they're so nice mm -hmm. um i i don't think i've ever like tried to have a conversation with somebody that was like standoffish or anything but i did ask alex if i could go out on an expedition with him and he never answered me and that's totally okay <laughs> i was at more yeah. expecting a no rather than okay. uh, being ignored but <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> he might not have seen it too, though, but that could um, be, that could yeah. be. Yeah. I, I, had, he's I had him on and I didn't realize, cause I watched his, some of his stuff. Right. And then I asked him to come on and like right on his profile, it even says it. And I didn't, I totally missed it um, that mm -hmm. he's from New Hampshire and he lives like two hours away from me. Um, yeah. So we hear on and I was like, I was like, I didn't realize you. Cause he was, he did the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh be on the trail um mm -hmm. in florida and he was talking about new hampshire but he's like oh back home in new hampshire blah 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 and i was like wait a second he's from new hampshire so he <laughs> yeah. was on. I, was like, I didn't realize you were from new hampshire he's like i thought that's why you wanted me on because i knew you were a main podcast and yeah. i was like no i had no idea but that's wild. um but yeah no small town monsters man you guys have a lot of really good good people um I met Heather at, in Pennsylvania at, at Squonkapalooza. Mm -hmm. She's a nice. sweet lady, such a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, man, um, I, but I did, 
out of the thing, some of the things that you just said, um, did have you gotten the chance to um, check out the Cryptozoology Museum, uh, Lauren Coleman's place up here in Maine? Yes, I have. I have. Did you? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, and the thing, the this is, a, yeah, it's just another case where uh, because of my involvement with small town monsters, it opened doors that I would. I didn't even know we're there. You know what I mean? I, I think you oh, do yeah. at this point. And so in 2017, we were, uh, Seth and I were both invited to come to the the conference that was held at the, the museum and at the hotel that's right by it there that was, was by it there at Thompson's Point. Yep. And it was, it was at that 2017 first conference that Seth was uh oh he had, i don't he had no idea this was going to happen he was he was awarded the uh, cryptozoologist of the year at uh that oh. at the conference itself um so with uh presented by lauren coleman with uh linda godfrey standing by and steve Bissett, uh seth received the golden yeti uh which is the the cryptozoology um cryptozoologist of the year and uh, Lauren invited me to MC the event, I think mostly to make sure <laughs> that we would both be there. So I would be there to sort of document him receiving the award. And uh, uh -huh. so that was just a, a fascinating thing. And then two years later, he invited us to return. And the first night of the conference, uh, both my son and I actually spoke at it. You know, I did a... Uh -huh. Uh, a quick sort of half hour segment on the Peninsula Python, which is a Northeast Ohio historical cryptid. And my son talked about just as his, his experiences in what drew him into cryptozoology in the first place. And the, the most amazing part about that, uh, well, the, the, mo the first amazing thing was he was invited. We were invited in the first place. But the second most am amazing thing is that he spent a lot of his time talking about how important the legend of Boggy Creek was to his um, whole viewpoint on cryptids and Bigfoot, et cetera. And in the audience was um, Pam Pierce, Pam uh, Barcelou, Par Pam Pierce Barcelou, who at yeah. the time was just starting to consider the idea of restoring the legend of Boggy Creek in, you know, for, um, high resolution blu-ray and ultimately 4k and okay. she was sitting there with her husband dave and they told us this later so it's not conjecture on my part but they told yeah. us later on when we saw them at a, a later conference that when andy talked that night um pam kind of elbowed her husband in the ribs and said you see there is a market for this there are kids who are interested <laughs> in this so uh -huh. in a very in a very small but significant way, you know, my son can say he helped play a role in um, convincing Pam to really do the um, the restoration of Legend of Boggy Creek, which That's is uh, awesome, isn't that a and, and you know it, it's just uh, it's so nuts to think that that all those things are related to one another. So yeah, absolutely. And, it's such such a great thing. I, the, now, what I have not seen is where the new museum is going to be. I'm very excited at some point. Oh, I didn't to make know it he back. was relocating. Yeah, he's going to Bangor. Is it? How do you say that right? How do you say that like a Mainer? Is it Bangor? Bangor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bangor. Yeah, yeah. It's going to. It's it hasn't relocated yet, but it's going to all end up there over the next couple of years. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause I feel, I do feel like this, his, I mean, his spot is nice. Um, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's more, like he could use a, a little bit more space. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, and then he has the, he has a conference coming up in April too. I think it's like the 27th or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and go to that. Uh, yeah. cause I didn't start going to the conventions until last year because of the podcast. So I'm trying to network it and trying to get mm -hmm. people to like interested and in talking and stuff like that. And 
I, I think it's one of my f- most favorite things about this whole thing is conventions, mm-hmm. you know, because ev- everybody just wants to talk, you know what I mean? Right. Everybody's just like, hey, man, I saw this or what do you think about this? What is your theory yeah. on that and stuff? And it's um, it's a lot of fun. And I've never really been much of a people person, mm-hmm. but this podcast, it it put me on that path. And I, I'm actually, you know, I don't mind it anymore. I don't mind talking to people as as much as i uh used to hate it <laughs> so no. hey everyone i'm shelly and i'm eric and we're the hosts of gruesome and unnatural a true crime podcast about murder cold cases missing people and just a natural join us every monday where shelly tells me gruesome stories that absolutely f- with me yeah subscribe and listen on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcasts oh i get it i get it yeah so um with the church and all like well how do they do they know that you because i know sometimes you know when religion meets you know the supernatural and stuff like that you know um a lot of people are like they're scoffing at the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, So how does that, how does the, the the church and, and your uh, views on cryptids and stuff intertwine? Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you asked that. I, it's, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but for me, I'm very fortunate in that I serve at a congregation where it's, it's all above board. You know, they know what I'm into. And I made sure that nice. I made sure that they knew because I, I haven't been at the church I'm at currently for all 25 years, but I I've been there for eight years. And mm-hmm. during the process of me going to that church, you know, it's like anything else. There's a series of interviews and conversations that you have with people. Mm-hmm. And I made sure that I led with, you know, here's all the important stuff that I'm sure you want to know. And by the way. This is my pastime. This is my hobby and my my main interest outside of working hours. Are you okay with that? And everybody was. And I think that that's that's not always the case, but I think over the past, probably the past 10 to 15 years, you know, there's been a lot of inroads that have been made a lot through TV and the internet certainly that have given people more permission to talk about these things without just being made fun of or in the church, you know, instantly treated as if you're looking into deep, dark, evil things just by being interested in the the Bigfoot topic. And, um, you know, not, I can, I can say very candidly that, you know, around my birthday, it's not unusual for, a, a Bigfoot t-shirt to show up on my desk, or I can like this past, <laughs> this past Christmas, one of my members gave me this really cool puzzle uh, that's shaped like a Bigfoot with all these artistic things inside of it. So they've really embraced it. You know, not everybody takes it seriously, but I haven't ever faced right. any, any flack for being, uh, you know, involved to the degree that I am. And I think a lot of people think, find it very interesting and even inviting to a certain degree. And what I mean is I've had a couple people approach me off the record and say, you know, I've had some experiences that I can't explain. And I never thought that I would be able to talk to my pastor about it. But Mm -hmm. since you are, you know, you have one foot in this world, uh, here's Mm -hmm. some things that have happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. I mean, I, I'm glad that they feel a, a sense of openness because uh, when you've probably had this experience many times, once people have had something happen to them that they can't easily deal with, there's a need to talk about it mm-hmm. and you, you can't, you can't keep that bottled up. And so I'm, I'm glad to be that person because they know that I'll, I'll listen to them and I won't scoff at their tail and I'll, I can probably tell them other things that other people have experienced that are a lot like what they've gone through. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool for them to have that. Um, you know, cause that's, that's kind of like what I try to provide through the, with the podcast, you know, a lot of people like 
because mental health is super important to me. And I know like when you experience, when you have these experiences, you tend to think that you might be a little bit crazy. And when your therapist is like, you didn't see that you were hallucinating. And then you're like, Mm -hmm. I am crazy. And then, you know, and then you just, you lose your mind completely. Mm -hmm. And I do know that, you know, they are making like um, formative steps to try and make therapy a little bit better for people that have had these experiences we're not 100 percent there yet but um work is being done and work still work needs to be done so uh i feel like you know people like you and you know podcasts like mine because there's several others mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. are here to help and um just let people know that they're not alone you know and right. i think it's phenomenal what, what you do and i've always I've always been, um, I don't know the best word to describe it, but um, I guess awe in a way of, you know, somebody like a pastor and stuff like how well you guys can, um, you know, speak to a room full of people Hmm. um, about scripture and whatnot. And I've always been like, man, I could never get up in front of such a crowded crowd of people and, you know, speak so confidently the way you guys do. And it's, um, it's amazing. And I will say this, I've never been like super religious, but I think I'm becoming a little bit, um, Mm. when the more people that I talk to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I mean, I've always known that there was, you know, something more than myself. Um, but I think like I was, there's been a couple people that have opened my eyes to things and stuff like that. And, um, like the conspiracy side of things, I'm, I'm like, you know, I think God is real. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I think this is more yeah. real than I was like really thinking it, it he, right. he was. So, yeah. so it's, it's people like you. So I, 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 th- I just want to thank you for that. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I appreciate that so much because, you know, it, it's funny with, when you are in, the public eye with something like small town monsters that could be a little bit um, intimidating to some, but for me, I've already, (laughs) I was in the public eye already in just a smaller, smaller um, situation, you know, in the, in the world of the church. But I think one thing has helped the other in my case, you know, I'm able to, to really just try to, to put ideas out there, and to be a, a, a good listener, of course, is absolutely important For sure. um, in both in both realms. But uh, I, I appreciate what you have to say there about you know pastoral ministry because it is. I mean, the, my personal beliefs about it um, are very much that there's a part of this that's a, a giftedness that you receive. You know, in, in other words, God gives you what you need in order to do what he wants you to do. Yeah. Um, because there had, there was a time in my life where the thought of doing exactly what you've described and, and what pastoral ministry and speaking on a movie or a podcast to who knows how many people, the thought of that um, made me physically react in a way that made it hard to speak. I, I just let's call it stage fright or whatever you want, but I mm-hmm. just didn't want any part of it. And it's something that both is a a giftedness that an enabling, if you will, and also uh, developing certain skills to do it. Those two things kind of go hand in hand. You know, I certainly public speaking is a skill and and something that you can get better at just by doing it. But um, Mm -hmm. I guess what I, what I'm driving at with that is, I really believe that when God wants you in a space, he'll give you what you need in order to get it done. And I'm living proof of that because there is a time when speech class is like something I would try to avoid if I could, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I I a reason all. not to show up, but, uh, you know, here we are now, uh, 26 years later, um, it's it's an opportunity that I that I take seriously in the sense that 
evidently there's a reason for me to be here and your encouraging words are kind of part of that to me. So thank you. Oh, man. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I kind of like got goosebumps. I don't know why, but <laughs> yeah. you know, when he speaks to you, you know, right. Um, I will. So I wanted to ask you this, if you have any, you know, pointers for somebody who might be speaking for the first time. So I will say within this question, I, in September, I will be speaking for the first time um, at a, a convent, a cryptid convention in Massachusetts. So um, as far as public speaking, what do you, mm -hmm. I guess, the best advice that you could give somebody wow. who's just oh, starting? Okay, cool. That's very good. I think uh, part of it is don't be afraid to practice. Uh, I still, you know, a couple decades into this plus, I will take sermons or, or Bible studies or presentations that I really want to do well, and I'll just go in a room. Uh, uh, most of the time I have a manuscript that I've written out word for word, and I'll just, I'll do it. I'll, 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 do the sermon as if there were a room of people there, but it's just me and the wall, you know? <laughs> and if I'm, if I'm really feeling ambitious, I'll record myself so that I can listen to what I actually sound like and sort of critique myself to see, uh, is, is, am I somebody that I would want to listen to? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I would, I would encourage you to do that, you know, work out as much of your presentation as you can ahead of time. And go in a room somewhere and just practice it, listen, get used to the sound of your own voice in that format. And um, I think that that's the key is that you put that sort of work in ahead of time so that when you get yeah. to that, when you get to the, the moment, you get to that day where the people are really in the seats, um, you're not thinking about technique. You're thinking about the message. And I think that might be the ultimate key is that, you know, it's good to think about techniques and what parts you want to hit strongly and so forth, but do that all ahead of time and get that so worked into your head that when, when the lights go on, you're really concentrating on the point that you want to get across. And I think something that is, is it really is super helpful to me is, is keeping in mind that the vast, vast majority of people would never, ever want to be in your shoes as the person who's <laughs> up there in front. Yeah. So they, there is a, a great deal of um, support for you. You know, as the person who's doing the talking, they, they want to hear you and they want to hear you do well because there's a part of them that knows they would never want to be in your shoes. So they really appreciate the fact that you've put the work in to be there. Mm. So, you know, I, point. that gives, that gives a lot of confidence, I think, and is very helpful. I think, you know, I'm, I know that I'm at my best when I'm not thinking about technique at all, whatever the subject is, I'm just trying to really communicate with the people who are in front of me. And 90% of the time you can see right away if you are communicating with them or not, just by reading their attention. It, right. Some some people will never react, but a lot of people will react and sort of nod even if they're not realizing that they're doing it. And you can then, um, you know, that that helps you too, to get that kind of immediate feedback that you rarely get on a podcast, right? Or, you know, like <laughs> you record something for a film and, and you have no idea how people are going to respond. Uh, in a public speaking setting, you know right away if something is going over or not. And also work in as much humor as you possibly can. I think that makes, that relaxes you and it relaxes your listeners to know that you know, you can take the subject seriously, but maybe you don't take yourself so seriously. And that puts them at ease right out of the gate. Those yeah. are just some things I would would say. Good points. Good points. I like it because uh, I, I think that I'm funny. 
I'm and I might be the yeah. only one that thinks I'm funny, but that's okay. <laughs> that's, okay. <laughs> that's who matters most. I mean, <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> if you don't make yourself laugh, then you know who else. Nobody else is going to join you. But that's Absolutely. another thing. That's another Absolutely. thing. If you are, in, if you are, I'd say it that way. If it's clear that you are enjoying yourself, people will pick up on that right away, right yeah. away, and they because yeah. they want to enjoy your presentation as well. And if you. If it's clear that you like what you're talking about, you're into it, um, that enthusiasm is, that goes a long, long way. Great, great. Good advice, Mark. Thank you very yeah, much. I'm sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so with all the stuff that you do with mo uh, Small Town Monsters, um, have you yourself ever had any kind of encounter or experience? Nothing that I can point to as a direct encounter. I, I think I may have been close on a couple of occasions. Okay. We did a, a, a YouTube series and uh, it was centered in Minerva, Ohio. Uh, at that time, we had access to property in the Minerva area, which is, you know, sort of a north central Ohio, which is famous for Bigfoot sightings and the Minerva monster, of course, is, is one of those. And that whole case came out of that very area. Uh, Seth and I went out and spent the night at the cabin on that property. And while we were there, um, you know, we did some night investigations. We went out with camera in hand and turned all the lights out and just sort of waited in the dark. And there may have been something around us at that time. It even seemed like things were being thrown at us, although it was not 100% conclusive that it wasn't something falling from the trees above us, as just that, and it being uncanny timing. But um, certainly in that same location, then Seth claims to have had a daytime Bigfoot sighting on that property, and other people have reported hearing footfalls and. Uh, feeling as though the cabin was being approached. Uh, th that's more in the middle of the night type stuff. Mm -hmm. So that that's one experience that I would say is a, is a maybe. Um, I've had pastoral experiences actually that are uh, fairly strange and without, without getting into like, um, naming names or anything. I've had experiences where I've gone to homes in which people were experiencing various types of disruptions that they would have attributed to uh, probably a ghost or an evil spirit. And representing God and representing the church, I went into those homes to do a kind of prayer and cleansing type of thing. And uh, the most eerie thing that happened was, uh, you know, I was with a, a mother and a very small child. The, the child was somewhere between two and three years old. And, you know, you whenever you show up in somebody's home, you, there's always sort of a, a, a formality type conversation that you have, you know, how's it going oh, yeah. and getting to know you type things. And, but that was all fine. And the little kid was absolutely pleasant to be around and, and, you know, like a three-year-old typically is. But when we, the eeriest thing was when I um, really began the series of prayers that I was there to do, all of a sudden that little kid let out the most blood, blood curdling, wailing scream oh my that goodness. you've ever heard. I, I mean, it, it, I would liken it to if somebody had snuck up behind him and pinched him really hard, uh -huh. that's the kind of sound that you would expect a, a three-year-old to make. And within about two minutes or so, he calmed down and was back to where he was before. So that's the that's probably the winner for the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. But that was well in advance of any small town monsters thing. This was back in 1990. Five, 1994, 19, no, I'm sorry, 96, 97, um, in okay. Southeastern Ohio, uh, wow. when I was a pastoral intern. So that's, that's probably the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, 
it, yeah. when things happen with kids, it creeps me out. I feel like it creeps me out the most. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, Absolutely. So, um, I can't, I don't remember what religion this woman was, or I can't even remember what scripture she was reciting, but that story reminds me of a story that happened to me when I think I was like in eighth grade or something like that. Uh, but I was at, at a friend's house and we were, we were coming home, I think, or we were leaving either way. She got us like right outside of his uh, driveway and she had, she had the Bible in her hand. She was with a, it was an older woman. She was with a younger w- woman. And she asked us if she could talk to us about God. And we we're like, yeah, sure. So we were standing there listening and she like, like not even a full minute had gone by and all of a sudden like she said the word she said uh, when jesus did this or something like that you hear this cat just go uh-huh. like across the screen yeah. we're, like, we're all like what the hell and she just, <laughs> she starts laughing and she goes oh the devil always trying to distract us yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was like oh man God, i guess so <laughs> and it was like a loud screech and then you see the cat mm-hmm. running and but yeah. it was and that creeped me out because it sure it, out of nowhere. I was just like, "Oh my goodness!" Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those that, that's kids. Kids uh, when things happen to kids, it creeps me out for sure. Sure, uh, yeah. there's there's so many documented stories of that. Like um, like one podcast I was listening to today that talked about the Enfield um, haunting there in uh, the UK, where mm-hmm. uh, the little this little girl was supposedly being possessed um and the warrens kind of went over there or whatever mm-hmm. um so with uh, all your research and stuff like that i wanted to um basically see because i like to ask everybody that um looks into uh you know the cryptid creatures and stuff what you think they are do you think mm. that they are real like creatures that live here full time do you think they're something more paranormal do you think they're a little bit of both or Mm -hmm. what's what's your line of thinking on on that yeah no that's i love that's an insightful question because i think on one hand certainly cryptozoology in the strict sense absolutely includes a biological animal species that just haven't been classified yet or right. you know may have been classified at one time thought to be extinct but it turns out they're still here <laughs> um of course you know the the international cryptozoology museum's symbol is the coelacanth which is an example of uh a, a fish that was thought to have been extinct and then was rediscovered so that certainly is under the umbrella of cryptozoology in you know the romantic biology sense, meaning just the idea that there are there are animals out there yet to be discovered that we haven't yeah. put a name or a label on. Um, that's not I I don't now I don't hold to the idea that that explains everything. I think that there are other cases that are just too strange, or that's that challenge at the idea that everything is flesh and blood. Um, and here, of course, I'm thinking about the more, the, the stranger cases having to do with Bigfoot and the type of things that uh, Stan Gordon, the Pennsylvania based researcher is famous for having documented. And, you know, we, where you have track lines uh, that look like classic Sasquatch tracks that are, you can follow those, um, to a certain degree and then they just abruptly stop it's like where did they go um i i I do believe that there's there's an element to this that uh kind of transcends a a one-size-fits-all flesh and blood explanation uh beyond that you know of course i don't know how that works but i i do think that there are um whether that has to do with our perception of things. I, I I really think human perception plays a huge role in this. And once in a while, I've heard people talk about this in a very thoughtful way, which I appreciate, but it's simple things, you know, like our ability to see a certain range 
of colors, but only so far. Or the idea that, uh, for example, there's radio waves around us all the time that we, you know, you don't pick up on those unless you have the right equipment. And then you can dial through a whole range of different programs, but otherwise they're imperceptible. And I, I am willing to entertain the thought that some of the things that people see and encounter, even if they somehow come through an imperceptible place to where we are and they're physical for a time, something enables them to go back to that, that place where we normally can't perceive them. I'm, I'm very open uh, to that whole possibility. So it's sort of, it's, it's a both and for me. Uh, certainly there are, there are animals out there that have evaded our detection, I, especially mm -hmm. in the oceans. I mean, that seems to well, be a, a no brainer, but then when we get into, you know, people are sometimes derisive and kind of make fun of the idea of the, um, like a, what the, they kind of jokingly or not call it the woo. And, you know, <laughs> I, I'm pretty okay with woo topics. I, I, I don't have Me any too. problem at least playing around with the idea because the fact is a lot of those stories include the, the stranger end of things. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've gotten to a place where I would like to know the whole story in any of these cases. Don't don't chop off parts that don't fit into a certain worldview just because they're inconvenient. You know, let's hear the whole the right. whole story and then take it from there. Absolutely, absolutely. I because you know, there's so many people that are in the the camp of that. You know, like Bigfoot specifically is just a creature that's physically here that we can poke, touch, or anything if we get close enough. Um, we just can't find them. And then there's people that are like, Bigfoot's a ghost, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. And then I'm like, well, what if it's both, you know? All right, I think I hacked in. We're on the air? Shh, security's outside. But how's my hair? It's a radio station. Psst. You guys hear about the Beyond the Shadows podcast with Ryan and Scott? You guys into paranormal? What about true crime? How about UFOs and cryptids? We also have mad hauntings. We got security. No, we don't. We're not big enough to need it yet. No, we got security. Hey, what are you guys doing? Get out of here. Listen to the Beyond the Shadows podcast. Get Beyond the, the Shadows. Shadows. Yeah, that's that, that's my line of thinking anyway, mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're you're in the same boat. Um, I definitely I believe in inter interdimensional travel. Um, mm -hmm. There's you know there's a lot of signs for time travel where I'm not 100 percent sure if the time travel thing is you know quite cohesive, but um, uh, it seems like um, there's I mean, yes, there's still creatures that haven't been discovered. Like the platypus was discovered. I was just talking about the platypus the yeah. other day. That I, I can't remember what year it was discovered, but everybody thought that was a cryptid for a long time. And I sure. think it was like maybe the 20s, maybe. Mm -hmm. I could be incorrect. So don't quote me on this, people. <laughs> don't come for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but The platypus um, society will be after you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I just, and then there's, cause I've been hearing a lot of stories and I've heard stories too. Like, so, um, I think it was around four, 2014, 2015, my son was wicked into Bigfoot and he would watch finding Bigfoot. And I wasn't quite mm -hmm. like there yet. I knew cause I've had, I experienced a lot, everything that mm, I've experienced had been, you know, ghosts of some mm. kind or, mm -hmm. uh, or some kind of and spiritual entity. Um, and it's been a lot. And then my son's watching finding Bigfoot and he loves it. And I'm just like, Bigfoot, like I was like, Bigfoot isn't real, but I didn't say that to him. I never said <laughs> okay. it. To him. I was okay, just yeah. like, do you really believe in this? He's like, 
He's like, I don't know, but it's scary. He said, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like at seven or eight at the time. Yeah. Um, so we, I would sit there and we'd, we'd watch it and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there's, there was a lot of stories that, um, that not only that, I, that they talked about on the show or talked to other people, but there in podcasts that I've listened to recently too, like there's UFOs sightings and then they see a Bigfoot or they see a Bigfoot and then they see a UFO. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's something weird with that too so um i guess what i'll ask now is do you believe because i I know you talk about ufos too Mm -hmm. do you think that (laughs) aliens or you know what we would perceive as aliens in in these ufos do you think they're from out there or do you think they're here Hmm. Yeah, that's, wow. I think that uh, my personal thought on that is that it's, it's, it's quite possible that they could be from here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, over the last, you know, it's been fairly recently, I don't know exactly a year count to this, but the more that I hear about the uh, USOs and the, the stuff yep. coming, going in and out of the ocean, you know, there, or, you know, the Antarctica stuff, who's to say I, there could be a presence that, that has been here for a time. Um, mm. And it, it, it's alien, they're alien in the sense simply that they're not us, but that doesn't necessarily right. mean an extraterrestrial origin, although it could, you know, I'm not closed off to the idea that there could be uh, beings from other places in the galaxy it just mm-hmm. doesn't, you know, people have asked me very directly about that, you know, in terms of a biblical faith. And I, my consistent response, I think, has been that there's nothing scripturally that would disallow for that, you know, just because that hasn't, that is not part of the story of the Bible doesn't mean that it didn't happen, because what scripture describes is a creative God who can speak anything into existence that he wants. And, and the Bible, as big as the Bible is, it tells a limited story. You know, it's very on point for being as large of a book that it is. Uh So it's not necessarily trying to say the last word on everything in the universe. How could it possibly do that? So um, all that is to say, you know, it, it it could certainly be either one of those. It could be both. But the idea of it, there being a presence here, I think is is fascinating and is really worth delving into. You know, we just oh, yeah. did a show. It's not released yet, but it would. It's a. It's called UFOs Revisited. In fact, that's why I had to reschedule <laughs> this recording that I'm doing with you. Is that um, in late February we had a panel. Uh, that met in Canton, Ohio. That's going to become a YouTube series. We did oh, nice. about, yeah, we did about 15 episodes worth of content over three days, uh, all on the UFO subjects. And a lot of oh. what we talked about during that time was underground bases, all the stories that have come out about um, like train systems and stuff that's underground and you know ranging from mundane stuff like bomb shelters all the way to you know the this uh, some of the stories about um having to do with like did, they dug too far underground and broke into some chamber and aliens came out with plasma weapons i mean there's a whole, uh, a whole <laughs> range of stories but but what that serves to show is that there are there, there is a whole body of accounts that have to do with either under the water or under the earth. There are realms that uh, we don't know a whole lot about. And when we mm-hmm. go poking into them, it tends to not go well. So uh, that's, that's, that came up a lot, surprisingly, for a show that was about UFOs and things in the sky. Uh, we spent a good chunk of that time talking about what's under our feet. So I thought that was kind of interesting. 
That is interesting. That's super yeah. interesting. That's cool that you made 15 episodes in a span of three days too. Like, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> Um, it really it was quite a it's quite a thing and in fact i was only there for two of the three days i i couldn't get that much time off but um you know the people on the panel were uh myself aaron deese who's with small town monsters heather Mosier, who you've met yeah um ron murphy who's done a lot of writing um oh, i just uh, i just had ron murphy on the other day did you oh sweet <laughs> speaking sweet. of <laughs> yeah yeah great great guy and oh my uh, goodness yes it's fascinating and katie page from colorado was also on the panel and micah hanks were that was the six and myself obviously nice. um so it was really good and you know this is the first time we'd ever done that so walking into a situation like that you're kind of thinking in the back of your mind, you know, what's the chemistry going to be like and how's the flow of the conversation going to go? And it went amazingly well. It's kind of like you were saying at the beginning of the show, you know, the vast majority of people that you meet who share this interest really are genuinely wonderful people mm. and um, are, are really trying to help each other out as much as they can. And that was really evident in this in this endeavor, but it is a lot. I mean, we were going from like 10 o'clock in the morning to five o'clock each day with a lunch break, but it was just one after the other. So it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting to watch, go back and watch those after they've been edited to sort of see, you know, were we starting to fade on these <laughs> afternoon shows or not, you know, hopefully not too bad. Uh, I can't wait to see it now. Oh my Good. goodness. Um I was gonna I had another UFO question and I forgot it. Mm -hmm. Um I because I wrote some of them down. Okay. But not all of them. Um so oh yeah, okay, I remember it. I remember it. So great. There's been a lot of stories about, you know, the Bible, obviously, and people's in different interpretations about it, right? And um, you know, a lot of these, there's a lot of conspiracy, ep, uh, podcasts that I listen to that talk mm -hmm. about the Bible, talking about the firmament that, you know, leads into flat earth. Now mm. I will say this before, you know, I, you know, I really get into this is I like the conspiracy idea of the flat earth. Mm -hmm. Excuse me real quick. I gotta let my dog out of the, oh. out of the room. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> it usually lasts a bit longer than that. Uh, okay. But, um, yeah, so um, I don't believe in Flat Earth. I just really love the idea of it yeah. and the stories about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'll ask is, it, the question would be, is what, um, what does Scripture talk about with the firmament? Like, what does it actually say? Yeah, that, I think the best thing that um, the best way that I have to describe the firmament in terms of the created world is that it does appear that it was some sort of uh, extra layer, if you will, almost mm -hmm. of um, atmosphere, extra layer of vapor, if you will, and that that was that helps you know in the accounts of a worldwide flood which i i do believe the bible talks about pretty directly yep. that that helps explain where all that water came from is essentially what what consisted of the firmament let loose as rain and and came down it, that in addition to water sort of welling up from uh the great deep there's a the sense in the scripture that you know there were these great cracks or fissures and the water came both came up from below and down from above so that when 
the firmament was spent, you had a different world after the fact. You know, obviously it was a, a flooded world, but I also mean that after the flood receded, you had a, a different atmosphere, you had a world working in a different way. And the main place where you see that is in the length of human life. Uh, you know, the Bible is famous for having these extraordinarily long lifespans in the early Old Testament. So you have Methuselah, you know, who's like 900 plus years old and and all of these folks with these extremely long lifespans, which which seem, you know, unlikely to us until we consider that the firmament was still in place at that time. This is all pre-flood. All those long life people were pre-flood. It's only after it's only post flood that you get into like a super long life being 120 years. And it, it sort of quickly tracks down to if you live to be 70 or 80 years old, that's a long life in the ancient oh, yeah. world. So then the dividing line is the the firmament being absorbed into, you know, the, the regular sort of water cycle of the natural world. That's that's the best sense that I can make of firmament, and I I I know what you're talking about because uh, back when Seth and I did the Monsteropolis podcast, we did an entire episode on flat Earth hypotheses, and it's it's utterly fascinating to hear what people come up with. Sometimes I will say, from my perspective, and how I use the Bible, how I was taught to interpret the Bible. A lot, you know, a, a huge fundamental for me is that when you're interpreting scripture, you have to know what what genre of writing you're dealing with. And so what I mean is that there, in the Bible, there is narrative reporting of events. There's also poetry. Uh, there's also personal letters from one individual to a congregation. And so you have to know what the genre is before you can interpret it uh, accurately. And then, then you throw in stuff like the book of Revelation, which is an apocalyptic style of writing in which essentially it's, it's symbolism. If you like paranormal, true crime, and some cryptids, or just anything weird, Check out Ouch, Was That a Ghost? Brought to you by your host, Liz. You can find Ouch, Was That a Ghost on Spotify, Apple, or any audio platform. New episodes drop every Thursday. And great problems have resulted when people have ignored what the genre is and interpreted something literally. And one, one super simple example of this is, you know, in the book of Psalms, the Psalms are poetry. The, the Psalms are the songbook of the people of the Old Testament. And like any poetry, it uses metaphor. So it describes God as a fortress. It describes God as a tower. Mm. Now, a person could come along, rip that verse out of the Bible and say, God is God must be made of stone because the Bible says God is a tower and towers are made of stone. Therefore, no. you see what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You only reach that conclusion if you are ignoring the fact that this is a poem and poems use metaphors and we use metaphors all the time. You know, when I say he's a teddy bear about another person, I don't mean they're literally a teddy bear. <laughs> I mean that they're <laughs> warm and cuddly and stuff like that. And the problems, you know, historically, great problems have arisen when people have taken passages out of context or ignored the genre that they were originally written in and used that to say, um, see, the Bible is making this claim. And I've heard that that sort of use of scripture to support their understanding of the firmament firmament 
specifically. Uh, they're taking literally things that I'm not convinced are meant to be taken literally because they're being spoken of in a poetic fashion. So that always has to be brought to bear in in each case. You know, it's the same thing where, you know, you get deep into the weeds of biblical prophecy in the book of Revelation and and there's a lot of numbers in the book of Revelation. And so the interpreter has to decide, were these meant to be symbolic numbers or were these meant to be taken literally? And sometimes people who take those numbers literally say, you know, history is divided up into thousand year periods and things like that. And sometimes that's help, helpful, but a lot of times it's not so helpful because especially if it makes you start predicting when things are going to happen, uh, there can be a lot of inherent problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, I will say, you know, people do get creative when, when they mm -hmm. try to use the, the Bible to make points there, when they try yeah. to make their, uh, I guess kind of like their weird points, I should mm -hmm. say, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, so it, it's it's fascinating, and I guess the the last question that I had um, is: I know that people try to, because you know, you have atheists and stuff like that. They always mm -hmm. try to dispel anything about the the Bible and stuff, and a mm -hmm. lot of them use the fact that the Bible talks about unicorns, and now. I know they're like, oh, do you think mythical? So you're telling me that the Bible is talking about these mythical horses and blah, 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 blah. Now, mm -hmm. I know that's not what the Bible means, but I was curious if you uh, could give um, kind of sort of the the people listening what um, the Bible meant by unicorn when it was when it says it. Yeah, well, I think part of that has to do with, uh, you know, the Bible was not written in a vacuum. You right. Know, there were there were other cultures around it that did influence the situations that were being faced by the people uh, who ultimately wrote scripture, you know, uh, I believe inspired by God, but a person had to sit down and put pen to paper at some point. Mm -hmm. And so that didn't happen in a vacuum. There were other, you know, legends, other cosmologies, other gods that were being talked about in the ancient world. And uh, some of those things sort of bled into the world by, you know, naturally, that's the world that we all live in and share. And so some of these ideas are going to transfer back and forth. You know, what the what scripture meant by unicorn is, uh, you know, very interesting to be sure. But there's a number of places in the Bible, along with the unicorn reference of of creatures that defy easy explanation, uh, one of them being Leviathan in the book of Job, which prosaically some people have said, well, that could just be a hippopotamus or a, 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 maybe a, a, you know, a, an elephant or something. But when you look at the description that is given, it sure seems to be something more on the order of a dinosaur, at least. Uh, so it's talking about these type of, um, you know, real world creatures, not not necessarily just to tell us about them, but to uh, say something, make a comment about uh, God's creative power or the power that he has over the natural world that uh, and, and the fact that there's there is mystery in the world. Right. Uh, you know, the, the Leviathan is a, described as a creature of the deep, you know, the deep waters. Mm -hmm. And I love the reference that's there because it's part of what scripture is saying to us, especially in the book of Job in particular, is that there's things that we as human beings don't know and probably will never know because we're, we're part of the creation and God is the creator of creation. Right. So he reserves mystery for himself and uh, he lets us know what he wants us to know, but there's things that only he knows and that's part of being human. And yeah. uh, it really gets to a, a 
it becomes very pointed at the end of the book of Job because Job has had some pretty awful things happen to him. Oh, yes. And he's, you know, he starts to ask questions like, you know, why and what am I supposed to do? And, you know, God, if you're really who you say you are, you know, where are you? And what are you doing? And God doesn't come down and just sort of give Job a pat on the back. He, he kind of says to Job, who do you think you are <laughs> to ask those sort of questions? You know, I, I mean well for you, and I'm, I, but I'm God, and I hung the stars in the sky. Another very poetic reference. Where were you when I did that? And Job sort of gets the point, kind of backs off a little bit, says, oh, okay, I get it, before yeah. he's, things are restored to him. But all of that is to say that um, what the, the thing that I love about the biblical worldview is that it does reserve mystery. You know, it never makes the claim that everything is understood by us and that we have everything figured out. Um, and that's where I've been able to really connect with people who, you know, and routinely I do get asked, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile your interest in cryptids and the unexplained with yeah, your course. role as a pastor with your, with, with the Bible. And I tell them, you know, you, you only have to reconcile something uh, that doesn't belong together or that doesn't get along. And I think yeah. that those two things get along just fine because um, the, the biblical faith presupposes a lot of mysteries and things that we don't understand and we'll never understand. And Absolutely. part of, Part of that is is reaching a point where you're all you, you can say, I'm OK with that. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, I've definitely reached that point. So that's a very <laughs> long, long winded answer to your original question. But I think that that's. Rather than using any one part of scripture to sort of prove or disprove or say, you know, you, you mean to tell me you believe in unicorns? Well, I. Yeah. Yes and no is the answer, yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, the Bible doesn't talk. You can look at that from the flip side also, obviously. You know, the Bible doesn't mention computers, doesn't mention yeah. cars. Uh, those things are obviously true. That, that doesn't contradict scripture uh, that we have these things. It's just that's not what the Bible is about. You know, I mentioned before, it's, the Bible has a pretty... Um, definite story that it's trying to tell and it's sure. not try it's not trying to be a textbook on all of science or all of history or all of astronomy it's concerned with um humanity more than anything and uh, absolutely our problems and the way out of those problems mm. yeah yeah i agree i agree okay i will say though um <clears throat> I always interpreted, well, I didn't always, but I always, I, well, I started to recently think about when they were writing this stuff, like what they had around them. So mm -hmm. I was almost kind of thinking when they reference, because they don't like tell like a story about a unicorn from what no, I understand. Right. I haven't read right. this, but they reference it like maybe two or three times. And I feel like, I don't know for sure, but I feel like they're talking about a rhino mm -hmm. because of yeah. the one horn, you know what I mean? Right. But yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I could be incorrect. Yeah. And I think that, you know, also what plays into that is this goes right in line with what you're saying. Uh, what plays into that is translation. Obviously yeah. the, the Old that Testament, too is uh written in hebrew originally and it's a very concrete language and anytime we pick up a bible and we're reading english words that's a translation so like absolutely with great certainty at the time of the king james version the idea of a unicorn would have made absolute sense in in making that decision as a, a translation choice because huh. You know, there are all sorts of fanciful things um, that, you know, are debatable as well. You know, dragons could go into that same category, right? Absolutely. Of, um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think what what the writers were doing, we also have to, to 
account for what the original Hebrew would be saying in a case like that. You know, and you get in, I was looking this up for somebody. It's so funny that you ask this because I was looking this up within the past month. Somebody was asking me about badgers. They're like, we, we see where there's badgers in the Bible. Did they really have badgers? And so I, I was like, I don't know. I, what you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're asking me a question I've really never dealt with before. So I, I went and looked. And a very similar principle was at work where Bible scholars today think that the word that was translated into English as badger is actually a reference to a sea lion because of the the mm. proximity to the bad the, the creature that's translated in some cases as the badger was close to water in this particular text and so there was a preponderance of sea lions around i, I think it was the sea of galilee which was the reference and so you know that sometimes the translator having to make a choice about what goes into english uses what they're most used to even if right. in the case of the unicorn what they're more used to is something that is more legend than biological fact so that that all just sort of jogged my memory as we've been talking about that nice nice um i definitely need to read the bible i think i haven't the only i think the only thing that i've read that has is considered biblical was the book of job and oh, okay um and also the uh book of enoch which i guess isn't considered uh a part of the bible it's more like a i don't know that it's because they are like oh it's fan fantastical or whatever it's mm -hmm. not not really scripture um but yeah Man, yeah, it's interesting this... though. Uh, the Book of Enoch, just real quickly. Um, yeah, it's it's not considered canonical. You're exactly right. However, there are parts of the New Testament that draw on the Book of Enoch and seem to take it fairly seriously. Now, that doesn't okay. that's not an endorsement of the entire book, but there are ideas that have been inherited from the Book of Enoch that New Testament writers do deal with. So it's it's on the it's on the line, I would say, uh, you okay. know, I, I, I certainly don't I don't treat the whole thing as scripture in the same way that I would treat like the gospel of John, for example. Right. But it's a, it has a lot to say about angels and angelology and hierarchies of angels. And, you know, of course, all the kind of the watchers language comes out of the book of Enoch. And yeah, I'm not saying that I think it's true in total or that it's not true i i think the the writers of the new testament at very least were quite familiar with what it said and and comfortable talking about it even bringing some of it into their writing so that's that's kind of fascinating really it it is fascinating i and i enjoyed reading it like it was yeah it was it was a fun read like mm -hmm. i mean again like especially because it's translated um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like, it's not clean sentences. So, right. and it's like here and then it's there within like a sentence, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, wait, what happened to this? Right. <laughs> where, where, how did we get from here to there? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, it was, it, it was still a, it was still a fun read, even though it's can considered it and, and i i believe in giants and giants is are referenced in uh the book of enoch so um i find I f that's i mean that i think that's the main reason why i read it was because mm -hmm. of the giant aspect mm -hmm. you know because of the because of the watchers and and whatnot um but with that i mean mark this is this has been a phenomenal conversation and i really oh, yeah. uh, I, appreciate you coming on man it's it means a lot to me that you decided to spend you know you know some of your time you know t speaking with me it's oh, yeah. means a lot um but i wanted uh to uh ask you uh my final like my closing question which mm -hmm. is my favorite of all and okay. are you finding fulfillment in your life with all of the things that you're doing oh i Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Nice. I am. Love uh, 
Yeah, I really, I, I've been, I'll use the language, you know, I'll use the churchly language. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to do uh, something with my life that helps people. I, you know, in my role and my calling as a pastor, I feel as though I am making a difference for the people that I serve. And, you know, I, I think that that's, that's foundational to a fulfilled life is doing things for other people that help them genuinely. And even, and sometimes, especially when they, they can't do anything to repay you or to help you back so that, you know, the, the help that you're providing is just sort of a, a gracious choice that you're making. And uh, that's a great, that's a great good. And then at the same time, because of small town monsters, I have been able to do things like we said, kind of at the beginning of our conversation, I would have never dreamed that I would be able to do, you know, 15 years ago, uh, even as recently as uh, uh, 11 years ago, I would never have believed that I had would have gone from coast to coast, you know, from from Portland, Maine to uh, British Columbia and the Olympic Peninsula and down to Boggy Creek, chasing mm -hmm. all of these all these things that fascinated me as a kid uh, and to be able to share that with people to have a small role in telling those stories and documenting cases and supporting Seth's vision for what STM has become. And for, for whatever reason, it all works, you know, and I think That's, I know the reason. Yeah, um, I think I do too. <laughs> yeah. But it, it really does work in a way that one doesn't get in the way of the other. Um, you know, uh, in almost freaky ways, you know, like the, the time that I devote to one thing has never robbed the other thing. And, and I don't know, I just interpret that as I'm supposed to be doing both. So I, mm. uh, I I'm believe very, that. I'm very grateful, <laughs> very grateful for what I've been allowed to do. Yeah. I love that for you, man. I, I really do. Thank you. Um, so what do you guys what what's coming next for small town monsters is it that oh man uh, that project that you guys that you were just talking about yeah yeah there's a lot there is a lot the most immediate thing is the the wide release of american werewolves 2 uh, oh, yes. that's that's coming this month a couple days in fact uh I, probably will be after this this comes out actually it's on the 15th of march that American Werewolves 2 will hit all the on-demand platforms and so on and so forth. The only people I believe to have gotten that so far were Kickstarter backers. I got their digital copy of it. Um, nice. So that's the most immediate thing. Uh, UFOs Revisited is coming very soon, and that'll hit YouTube, and I'm not sure what other formats that will take. Um, in a couple months, we'll have Monster Fest 2, our convention in Canton, Ohio. Uh, that happens near the end of June. And uh, that's, we bring in speakers and podcasters, and it's just a big celebration of small town monsters and what the, the fans have uh, to bring to the table. Uh, the night before Monster Fest, we are world premiering uh, Cursed Waters, which is nice. Eli Watson's uh, documentary on uh, Ogopogo. And he, he did that in conjunction with Jason Hewlett, who is writing a book on Ogopogo that's going to be released through Small Town Monsters Publishing. So it's a lot going on right now. Um, at the same time, there are, are many other things in the works. And um, this will be the first place I have talked about this particular project anywhere because the, it just got finalized yesterday. Uh, but oh, I nice. have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the, <laughs> this is the world premiere. Um, I am going to be writing 
the 10th anniversary book about small town monsters that will be published in 2025. And nice. yeah, so beginning with 2015's Minerva Monster, we're going to be taking a look back uh, on not so much movie by movie, because we've kind of done that with other projects. But what this book is going to be more about is how Small Town Monsters has changed the lives of the crew and everybody who's worked on these films. Uh, we're also going to be asking the cryptozoolo cryptozoological and unexplained communities, you know, what does what do you think STM means in the grand scheme of things? Uh, mm -hmm. What will what what place does it occupy? And we'll be asking the people who have let us know that uh, it's impacted their lives in very interesting ways uh, if they will tell their stories as well for this book. So, you know, I'm going to be compiling all of those stories and that's going to be for sure available to Kickstarter backers the next time we do a Kickstarter, which will be February of 2025. The book will be released sometime later that year. So it's that's something I'm really excited about right now. The gears are moving because I'll be, I'm just at the very beginning of that process right now. Nice. That's awesome. That is yeah. awesome stuff. I will say though, um, I am going to be at, uh, in Canton, Ohio for monster fest too. Oh, awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. I can't wait. I've, I wanted to go to the first one, but I, I just, I didn't have it in the, in the funds well i did mm -hmm. i probably could have but i didn't you know i had already a couple of them that i wanted to go to so yeah i just never did but i'm excited for it because uh another friend of mine that i made through podcasting is going to uh through the through the podcast he also has a podcast he's going to be there vending i believe oh okay uh so that that'll be fun um and i, I look forward to that but yeah Anyways, Mark, if you don't mind, one more time, letting okay. the good people know where who you are, where they can find you, and uh, plug your podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, um, first of all, you can find all sorts of Small Town Monsters goodies at smalltownmonsters.com. And uh, visit, for sure, the YouTube Small Town Monsters YouTube page. There's an awful lot that's there now um, just for free uh, to watch anytime that you want. You can become a squad member and that gets you access to things early and in in 4K, which looks nice and is a lot of fun. Um, you'll see things like I didn't even mention this. I've completely passed over it, but there's a series called Sasquatch Unearthed. There's been two seasons so far, one having to do with the Chestnut Ridge. The other season was West Virginia. And I narrated both of those, uh, co-wrote the West Virginia series. So those are a lot of fun. If you're looking for a place to start, I would recommend those for sure. Right. Um, and I also have been doing a self-produced podcast. There's been three seasons of it loosely. It's called Monster Study Group. It's on all the podcatchers. It's a real sort of narrow audience type show. Uh, and it covers the waterfront. I mean, it's everything from cryptozoology to Godzilla films and universal monsters and all of that stuff. It sort of combines all the things that all my hobbies and sort of niche interests in one place. Uh, mm -hmm. one, uh, one episode that I think this audience would really find interesting is one of the first ones that I did. And it's called um, How Japan Shaped Cryptozoology. And it traces the story of how Lauren Coleman uh, was introduced to the subject of hidden and unknown animals and has to do with a certain uh, Japanese monster movie, but it may not be the one that you are thinking of right now. So if you if that sounds intriguing, go listen to How Japan Shaped Cryptozoology, the Monster Study Group podcast. And also I... Um, I, I alluded to this, I think, towards the top of the show. I'm also thinking about a, a self-produced podcast that would take a little bit different format, um, more related to cryptozoology uh, that mm -hmm. could be coming down the line fairly soon. Um, so 
keep an eye out for that. I'll, I'll give you a shout if uh, that really does take off and uh, maybe you could share that on a, a future link or something, but. Uh, oh, I definitely will. Yeah. I definitely yeah. will be done. And you're going to do that with your son. Is that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He'd be the main producer for that actually. Nice. Yep. Nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, well guys, that is the show. I hope you, uh, go follow Matt, uh, Mark. Sorry, I confused you. No, that's name. okay. That's okay. <laughs> uh, go follow uh, Mark and everything that he's doing. Um, and uh, check out the small town monster stuff. Definitely go to that pot, uh, to his uh, podcast monster study group. Uh, that sounds super interesting. What yeah. number was that episode again? That, season. It's like, that was season one, I think is episode two or three right near the okay. beginning. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. I'm definitely, I'm personally going to check that one out. Um, oh, cool. Because that I sounds super that. interesting. Now yeah. I want to know what movie it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, please show Mark some love. Um, I would greatly appreciate it if you did so. Um, also, like, follow, share, subscribe if you enjoyed today's show. Um, and leave a rating and review. I would greatly appreciate it, but not a necessity. I'm still just happy that you're here listening um to this phenomenal uh conversation that i had with mark um very uh, i really enjoyed it and i hope you guys did too so with that everybody question everything and stay weird this concludes our broadcast day click Because in the end, none of us have very long on this earth. Life is fleeting. And if you're ever distressed, cast your eyes to the summer sky. When the stars are strung across the velvety night, and when a shooting star streaks through the blackness turning night, today make a wish